Hi guys. Uh, welcome to the last uh, webinar, summer webinar from this uh, season. Um, the last webinar is called Protein Purification and Characterization. Uh, my name is uh, Tania Pozo. I'm a member of the IGM Measurement Committee since 2018. And I'm currently a protein scientist in a company in California, Bay Area. And today I will begin uh, telling you uh, a little bit more about protein biochemistry and fundamentals. As you know, uh, as you know, proteins they have uh, different um, uh, structures. Um, uh, you can have the you can have the primary protein structures where you have amino acids uh, bound by the beta, peptide peptide bonds. But then these amino acids, they uh, begin to form hydrogen bonds and they can form these two, two types of secondary structures that they are alpha helix and beta sheet. And there is also uh, new types of interactions that these can bind together, like uh, hydrophobic bonds or uh, or ionic bonds or van der Waal bonds and then we get this tertiary structure where where the protein is uh, getting more the three-dimensional folding pattern and then this this protein this these peptides can be uh, form subunits so then we get the finally quaternary protein structure and this is how is the complete uh, protein. And but why I'm mentioning this is because I really think it's important for you to understand that protein needs to be uh, perfectly folded to get the function. And because of this uh, structure of the 3D structure, we will get uh, physical chemical properties for each protein. So, well, now I will talk to you a little bit more about uh, protein solubility. So if we have a protein in a media, we need to provide the appropriate salt concentration in the media to prevent uh, protein aggregation. And this is referred as salting in. And this means that if you have uh, the protein, uh, the ions of the salt, they will begin to bind around the protein, uh, helping, helping the protein to be soluble in water. And until a certain point where we will see here, as you can see here, where each protein is like a perfectly um, ionized with salt to, to be dissolved in water. But this is until certain point because if we add more more salt, the salt concentration in the media will enhance protein aggregation, and this is called salting out. Because in this case, the, if we have more molecules of, of uh, salt, they it will they will catch the water, and then the proteins they will begin to begin to clump to each other, and then they will form aggregates. And sometimes this could be good if you want to concentrate protein but it also could be bad because then your 3d structure will get lost and as you know you can lose the tertiary structure or the secondary structure and sometimes it could be reversible and your protein can get the right shape again or sometimes it's irreversible and that's bad because then your molecule molecule gets denatured so so proteins are ampholytes. What, what do you understand for ampholyte? Ampholyte uh, contains two ionized, uh, ionizable groups. One is acidic and the other is basic. And proteins, they have this character. And they also have a R uh, subgroup here that can change in each amino acid. So a medium's pH will determine the overall charge of the protein. What does mean that? So if we have here 
the protein at pH 11, the, uh, sorry, not the protein, the amino acid, uh, will have a negative charge. And this negative charge uh, at pH 11 will give you a negative charge of uh, minus one. So in, in here you have the pH and this pH will be changing. And then because of that, the net charge will also change in, in the amino acid. So, so at a specific pH level, the charge of these two groups can neutralize to create a net charge of zero. And this pH level is called isoelectric point. This is really important because in this case, this amino acid at pH 7.6 you see almost pH almost eight it will uh, be zero it will have the, the charges will compensate so you will have positive and a negative and this is this is really important to know for each protein so the pK is a constant that measures the potential for proton transfer so it tells you how 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 is the possibility of the the protonation in, in each amino acid? So the, this this uh, pKa's they are constants that you can find in a table for each amino acid, and this is how we get to know the net charge of our amino acids and then of our protein. Uh, and that's really important. So we will know you know what's the charge of our protein. So this is why I'm presenting you here a database called Expasy. That I, it's the database that I like, but for sure there's uh, many other databases that can do that. Uh, but uh, in this database, you can compute the physical chemical parameters of a protein based on the amino acid sequence. So what you need to do is get the sequence of the amino acid sequence, the primary uh, structure sequence of your protein, and then you need to paste it here in this in this space and then you will press compute parameters and you will get a list of well, physical chemical parameters that you will obtain for each protein and if you do mutations like let's say that you had this in this um, protein but you did many mutations you could do random mutations you could do side directed mutagenesis and you will have a new, a new protein and you need to do the same thing. You need to get the physical chemical parameters for each protein, even if you have mutated your protein. Mm, so then you will get a, a output, uh, mm, something like this. And as you see, there's a lot of information and you don't know what is what. So then I can tell you that here you are getting the molecular weight of your protein so you know how big and the size of your protein and this is good because in uh, this is good to know because in further purification steps you need to know how heavy is your protein how big and um, then you need to know the extinction coefficient because this extinction coefficient is going to tell you uh, how to quantify you will use this value to quantify protein you will also know the pi where is the where the where the pro, where the protein is like a neutral out so it's not positive it's not negative it's neutral so and that's good this is a value that you really need to know and then you will also know how many amino acids you have with negatively charged or how many are they positively charged and this is also uh, uh, good to know so you you will have an idea of your protein physical chemical parameters so you can have a picture like this so where you have two proteins here they have the uh, human serum albumin and lysozyme so as you can see these proteins they change the net charts at different uh, pHs like at pH 12 they are more negative sorry so you can see they are more positive so so you have to imagine that your protein in 3d is having different charges everywhere right and that's that's the, i want you to always imagine your protein in 3d 
So, um, but why the protein netcharge is important for purification? Because here in the middle is when your protein has the same amount of charges, positive and negative, and this is neutral. But if you see the pH, if the pH goes up, like say seven, eight, the negative charge, your protein will be more negatively charged. It doesn't mean that it's totally negatively charged, but it will have some positives, but the majority of the net charge, it will be negative. And here, when the pH is five or two, or the, the protein, your protein will be in a state of positively charged. And um, this is good to know because when you purify proteins, you will choose a resin, you will choose a column and the resin will be full with beads and the beads, they will have charges. So I will choose a negatively bead, a bead that is charged negatively. So my protein that is at this pH, let's say five, will bind. And this is the way how I'm going to purify. This is uh, called cation exchange. And this is called anion, anion exchange, chromatography. So this is why it's really important to know the, the charges, the charge, the net charge. So reasons to purify protein. So one reason to purify proteins uh, will be the elucidation of a 3D structure, and you will uh, use crystallography to do that. So for that, you will generate uh, protein crystals, and this means that the crystals, uh, you grow crystals. So you, you put a uh, protein that is really pure, highly, highly concentrated, and um, then the, 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 when you get the crystal, then you will uh, shoot them with x-rays, so you will have a diffraction pattern, and this diffraction pattern will help you to build up a 3D structure. And this is the real face of your protein. It's like you will see the face of the protein. And in this, in this case, you will know if it's a dimer, if it's a trimer, or how many, or how is the conformation stage of your protein. But you also can identify where is the active site and then generate mutants in this active site and, and also get uh, crystal structure of your mutants, so you can exactly understand how the substrate sits in the active site and how, which amino acids are uh, interacting with your substrate, and this is how you will know the mechanism of a reaction of your enzyme. You can also do functional studies, uh, like characterization of, of proteins or enzymes. Like for example, here I have a wild type. <clears throat> From it's a, it's a luciferase from firefly. It's the one that produces luminescence in fireflies. So it's a really well studied protein. So there was a lot of uh, scientists that they did random mutagenesis and they find out that there was a um, enzyme that had enhanced activity. So this means that it used to bright longer. There was another group that discovered that they could also um, mutate the the luciferase to get a thermostable mutant because luciferase by nature is not a thermostable um, enzyme. So what we did is we put together these two, these two mutations reported previously by other scientists and we created a, the hybrid luciferase called, called YY5 and we measured the luminescence. So this is the luminescence, this means how, how intense was the light and we use different substrate concentrations here. So we wanted to have little substrate, but really long light. And, and, uh, and so here we compare all the mutants and as you can see, YY5 was the best because uh, using really little substrate, it, can, it could be brighter, produce brighter light. So this is, um, a way to study functional characterization of wild types and mutants, but you can also study the physical chemical properties. So here I have the stability studies where you can have the wild type here and you can see that at 35 degrees, the wild type lost the activity of shining. It was not shining anymore, but the YY5 keeps shining for 
uh, when, when it was 40 degrees, uh, 360 minutes was still shining. So this is kind of like a, um, a good example to prove that your, your enzyme is uh, supporting high temperatures. You can also do a study of how good the substrate, this is the luciferase substrate, sits in the active site. And for that, you do kinetic assays where you can see that you have a Km value. This Km value needs to be low, as low as you can, if the substrate sits perfectly in the active site. So the wild type had this value, but the activity the mutant had lower. So this means that this mutant could uh, accept the substrate better than the wild type. And our, our thermostable mutant was not good, not, not so good. But the YY5, the mutant that had the temperature and the activity mutations, it was in, in between. It was not as good as the wild type, but we had temperature in our we could support temperature in our uh, and it was brighter light so we were happy with that <laughs> okay so summary of this um part uh, it will be i will give you uh, some tips as well uh, and it is crucial to understand the physical chemical properties of your protein of interest before proceeding to the purification steps so evaluating the stability of your protein over a range of temperatures and pHs will allow you to optimize parameters for purification methods. Running a stability assays will also indicate whether subjecting uh, your protein to freeze storage condition is appropriate or not. Purify the protein of interest according to the assays uh, the assays that you need to run, for example, if you need to run crystallization, it will require that you have a high protein purity and high concentration. So that's the things that you need to take in account. And uh, I think, Ian, we can go to questions if they have some. So far, we have one question. Um, okay. And it was in respect to the XPASI database. Uh, mm -hmm. Can this database give us the enzyme sequence of enzymes? And I think what they might be getting at there is the target sequence, the binding pocket. Yes, there's um, other databases like Unipro. Unipro, we could add these links in the in the final, but there is a database like Unipro and also NCBI. Like if you are looking for a specific sequence, but you don't know, let's say you want to find albumin or then you can type albumin sequence and then in Uniprobe you will get all the albumins that they are officially in the, in the database. So then you can copy that sequence and then use that in the ecstasy. So then you can analyze your protein sequence here and get the physical chemical parameters for your protein. Yes. All right, that was the only question we had for that section. We will be taking questions at the end of the next one and the subsequent af one after that. So please keep throwing them at us. You can do it in either the chat or in the Q&A function.